All we could see was the little red lights on the train's dashboard. Did you call it a dashboard on the train, you wondered? It didn't want to stop, because that meant it had to get out of the train into the dark. But the train was running out of track, so there wasn't much else it could do. He pulled back a little bit on the lever that made the train go and slowed down more. Just a little more. And the lever clicked into a kind of slot, and the train stopped with a little jerk that made him stumble and grab the edge of the cab. An electric train didn't make any engine noise, but the wheels rattled on the track, and the train made squeaks and clunks as it moved. When it stopped, the noise stopped too. It was really quiet. Hey, he said out loud, because he didn't want to listen to his heart beating. The sound echoed, and he looked up, startled. Mom had said the tunnel was really high, more than 30 feet, but he forgot that. The idea that there was a lot of empty space hanging over him that he couldn't see bothered him a lot. He swallowed and stepped out of the tiny engine, holding onto the frame with one hand. Hey, he shouted at the invisible ceiling. Are there any bats up there? Silence. He had kind of been hoping there were bats. He wasn't afraid of them. There were bats in the old rock, and he liked to sit and watch them come out to hunt in the summer evenings. But he was alone, except for the dark. His hands were sweating. He let go of the metal cap and scrubbed both hands on his jeans. Now he could hear himself breathing, too. Crap, he whispered under his breath. That made him feel better, so he said it again. <laughs> Maybe he ought to be praying instead, but he didn't feel like that. Not yet. There was a door, Mom said. At the end of the tunnel, it led into the service chamber, where the big turbines could be lifted up for the dam that they needed fixing. The door would be locked. Suddenly he realized that he stepped away from the train, and he didn't know whether he was facing the end of the tunnel or back the way he'd come. In a panic, he blundered to and fro, hands out, looking for the train. He tripped over part of the track and fell sprawling. He lay there for a second, saying, crap, 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 crap. <laughs> because he'd skinned both knees in the palm of his hand. But he was okay, really. And now he knew where the track was, so he could follow it and not get lost. He got up, wiped his nose, and shuffled slowly along, kicking the track every few steps to be sure he stayed with it. He thought he was in front of where the train had stopped, so it didn't really matter which way he was going. Either he'd find the train, or he'd find the end of the tunnel, and then the door. If it was locked, maybe. Something like an electric shock ran right through him. He gasped and fell over backward. The only thing in his mind was the idea that somebody had hit him with a lightsaber like Luke Skywalker's, and for a minute he thought maybe whoever it was had cut off his head. He couldn't feel his body. He could see in his mind his body lying bleeding in the dark and his head sitting right there on the train tracks in the dark, not being able to see his body and not even knowing it wasn't attached anymore. He made a breathless kind of noise that was trying to be a scream, and it made his stomach move, and he felt that. He felt it, and suddenly he felt a lot more like praying. Quartzia, Leo, he managed to gasp. It was what Manda said when he talked about a fight or killing something, and this wasn't quite that sort of thing, but it seemed like a good thing to say anyway. Now he could feel all of himself again, but he sat up and grabbed his neck just to be sure his head was still on. His skin was jumping in the weirdest way, like a horse's does when a horse fly bites it, but all over. He swallowed and tasted sugared silver and gasped again, because now he knew what it hit him. Sort of. This wasn't quite like it had been when they all walked into the rocks on Overcoat. One minute he'd been in his father's arms, and the next minute it was like he was scattered everywhere in little weedy pieces like the spilled quick silver in Granny's surgery. Then he was back together again. And Dad was still holding him tight enough to squeeze his breath out, and he could hear Dad sobbing, and that scared him, and he had a funny taste in his mouth. And little pieces of him were still wiggling around, trying to get away, but they were trapped inside his skin. Yeah, that was what was making his skin jump now. And he breathed easier, knowing what it was. It was okay, then. It was okay. It would stop. It was stopping already, the twitchy feeling going away. He still felt a little shaky, but he stood up. Careful, he didn't know where it was. Wait, he didn't know. He knew exactly. That's weird, he said out loud, without really noticing, because he wasn't scared by the dark anymore, it wasn't important. He couldn't really see it, not with his eyes, not exactly. He squinted, trying to think how he was seeing it, but there wasn't a word for what he was doing. <coughs> kind of like hearing or smelling or touching, but not really any of those. But he knew where it was. It was right there. A kind of shiver in the air. And when he stared at it, he had a feeling in the back of his mind, like really pretty, pretty sparkling things, like sun and the sea, the way a candle flame looked when it shone through a movie. But he knew he wasn't really seeing anything like that. It went all the way across the tunnel and up to the high roof, too, he could tell. But it wasn't thick at all, it was thin as air. I guess that was why it hadn't swallowed it, like the thing that the rocks on a brick oak had. At least, he thought it hadn't, and for an instant worried that maybe he'd gone sometime else. But he didn't think so. The tunnel felt just the same, and so did he, and his skin had stopped jumping. When they'd done it on a brick oak, he'd known right away it was different. He stood there for a minute, just looking and thinking, and then shook his head and turned around, feeling with his foot for the track. He wasn't going back through that, no matter what. He just had to hope the door wasn't locked. Well, thank you, and all of you who have been worrying.
don't know whether John and Jim went to time travel because they lacked the police for a while. And then, yeah, there are several clip makers that they did. But you may remember this one where uh, Jamie has been forced to flee from Philadelphia, taking along Lord John as an impromptu hostage. And as they're, uh, they're fleeing the city, John is worrying because he realizes he's going to have to tell Jamie, you know, what happened between him and Claire. Um, and he's afraid that Jamie's going to kill him immediately upon hearing it. They start gearing himself up to his, his fate. When he does get there, he's so he does that he just blurts it out, at which point Jamie just looks at him and says, oh, why? <laughs> so this is what happened next. He'd been quite resigned to dying. I accepted it from the moment that he blurted out, I had carnal knowledge of your wife. The only question in his mind had been whether Fraser would shoot him, stab him, or eviscerate him with his bare hands. To have the injured husband regard him call light and say merely, oh, why? It was not very unexpected, but infamous, absolutely infamous. Why, John Gray repeated incredulous, did you say why? I did, and I should appreciate an answer. Now that Ray had both eyes open, he could see that Fraser's outward calm was not quite so impervious as he first supposed. There was a pulse beating in Fraser's temple, and he shifted his weight a little, like a man might do in the vicinity of a tavern brawl, not quite ready to commit violence, but readying himself to meet it. Perversely, Ray found this sight steadying. What you bloody mean, why, he said, suddenly irritated, and why aren't you fucking dead? <laughs> I've wondered that myself, Fraser replied politely. I take it you thought I was. Yes, and so did your wife. You have the faintest idea with the knowledge of your death did to her? The dark blue eyes narrowed just a trifle. I began playing that the news of my death deranged her to such an extent that she lost her reason and took you to her bed by force. <laughs> <laughs> because he went on, neatly cutting off Grace, he did reply, and I was suddenly seriously misled regarding your own nature of a big substantial force to compel you to any such action. <laughs> but I'm wrong. The eyes stayed narrow. Grace stared back at them. Then he closed his own eyes briefly and rubbed both hands hard over his face like a man waking from nightmare. He dropped his hands and opened his eyes again. You are not misled, he said through clenched teeth, and you are wrong. Fraser's ready eyebrows shut up. In genuine astonishment, he thought. You want to her because you would desire? His voice rose too. And should I get? Yeah, I didn't believe it. The color was creeping up Fraser's hand neck, vivid as a climbing rose. Ray had seen that happen before, and decided recklessly that the best, the only defense, was to lose his own temper first. It was a relief. We thought you were dead, you bloody arsehole, he said furious. Both of us, dead, and we, we took too much to drink one night. Very much too much. We spoke of you. Damn you, neither one of us was making love to the other. We were fucking you. 